Okay, welcome, guys. Um, I'm here to introduce uh, Nicholas today. He's a systems uh, integrator at Internet Solutions. That's an unusual title. I've never really? heard of a systems integrator. No, that was two jobs ago. Oh. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was like four years ago. All right. Sorry. Um, um, was it practical in the meantime? And, current, and for the last two and a half months, I'm a tech a lot. Okay. I see. I That's see. where the logo is from. Right. 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 That would explain yeah. it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, so he's also interested in open source software, very interested in getting into projects in the community. Um, obviously, having been involved with PreCult, he's worked with uh, NGOs and communities that support uh, tech in South Africa. He's also a very, very wonderful parent, and that's what you know, you. his life is about. Um, kids and software and developing really hard arms. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Take it Everyone? away. Everyone? Um, so... That is today's talk, um, or rather how I got involved into working on an ORM. So, I mean, generally the reason I got involved with this is a few things. One, I really like async error. I think it solves a lot of the concurrency problems in a way that is a lot more elegant than threads. Um, Bruce covered it already. You don't have the um, concurrency isn't about doing many things at once, but about, it's about doing many things at once, not at the same time, necessarily. So, and this is really how computers end up working. So we, you have a lot less issues you can worry about with race, uh, race conditions and that. So I really do like async error, and mostly what I end up doing is integration. And another thing is, I realized once I started working more on async error stuff, it was difficult to persist data, uh, being that there wasn't a lovely, nice ORM that I could use that provides testing doubles and all these things. So I was like, hmm, I wanted to use both. So I was, went around looking. So. I'm not sure if you know, there's a, a project called Vibora, which is a similar thing to Senec and HTTP, uh, AO, HTTP. Um, and uh, on that framework, sorry, uh, I was sitting next door, sorry. And um, on that, on the, on the forum, on the, on the, some of the issues in GitHub, we were discussing, well, is there any ORMs that anybody knows of? We work with async based frameworks. Uh, there wasn't an answer. So I decided to have to go have a look. So before I actually get on with this, first I'm going to sum up what is a sync error. And as I sort of said, in roughly, um, it's got the lovely new async and await syntax that makes it a little clearer. And you know that pretty much you will only get side effects, potential in uh, intervention side effects, where you're awaiting something or there's a future. So when you do an await, something else can run as well. But when there isn't, so in the top one where I have query equals compute something, that's synchronous, and there will be, it will, there will no be, be no uh, race conditions happening at the same time, which is a really convenient way of being able to reason about your code, especially if you want to do um, concurrency and not have to worry about race conditions. And this is the real reason why I like async error, because I can say, I need to worry about this, but I don't need to worry about those. There's only certain entry points that you can have. And this is a simple example, and um, it's, it's easy to read. Uh, it is, as you said, you start at the top. This in the result equals await to queries often in language that doesn't have a coroutine syntax would be a callback. So then you'd have to break this into two different functions. I don't have it. I can reason from it from the top to the bottom. So that's what's really nice about async error. It makes that quite clear. And now, a quick summary of what is an ORM. Uh, it's something where a common pattern where you define a model. And the model define, I've got something called a name, it's a string, I've got a, some variable called happy, and it's a Boolean, all right, fine. And uh, now I'm going to say name one, and happy is true, and I'll just save it, and it gets persisted. I can kill the program, leave, come back later, it's still there. Later point, I can say, version to get name one, and I get my object back. So this is a, not a real implementation, it's just to present how it looks. But pretty much that's what an ORM is. It, it, it's wraps uh, data things often stored in a SQL database, but it could be in an object store, and makes it a native code object, um, a class, and then I could actually add my uh, uh, extra co uh, logic regarding that model in there that's specific to that model, aka, okay, um, you know, make happy with my change the happiness or optionally change it. Um, I'm not entirely sure, so I really want to do it. That's the basics of what an ORM is, and it's a, a very convenient way of persisting state. Um, yeah. So, 
how I'm resuming why I'm getting involved. So firstly, I looked around. I found lots and lots of um, attempts at taking a synchronous ORM and wrapping it in async OO. Um, the majority of them were abandoned for various reasons, mostly because people realized it was difficult. Or um, in one case, the ORM that was being wrapped, the person who did the original ORM, actually didn't want his code being wrapped, which is, I'd say, one of the weirdest reasons for a project to fail. Um, like, um, other than that, it actually looked quite promising. But uh, unfortunately, there was a lot of abandoned projects. Um, there was quite a few projects that was running up and going that gives you an ORM-like interface, but they only work with one data store. And I was like, well, no. I am that kind of guy that would love to replace my Postgres database with a SQLite in-memory database while I run tests. Like, that's a very convenient thing. I came from, did a lot of work with Django and SQL Alchemy, and that's something you can do easily. So I want that as well. Uh, or they just didn't work when I tried them. Um, so, you know. It was not that great, the slip, because of slip. But then I found Tortoise ORM, and a um, lovely little mascot. And uh, it was a simple design. It actually worked when I tried it. And whoever was doing it was Andre Bonjaro, who started it, wanted a Django-like interface, because that's another, well, he came from a similar set of world, um, where we're using the Django-style models to define objects. It was he said, he liked it. So I said, sweet, all right. Um, this is how I got involved. I really feel that you should all do this. Walk, go up to a project and start with a, a, an issue that's titled, wow, this is nice. I, I'm proud of myself there. I actually, uh, there's their spelling mistakes in that year. This is actually what I posted. So I was probably too excited to notice that I made grammar errors. But it's OK. Um, Andre is Russian. And uh, I don't think he ever com complained about my English which is fine. Um, right. But yeah, I really, so he was very receptive. He said, sure, um, please use it. Please come up with things. I said, well, there's a few missing details here, which is um, I, there was no proper test suit. He had a whole series of examples. Um, and there was a lot of housekeeping needed to get done. So even though dealing with Andre uh, is, was really amazing, he knows databases, much better than I do. I've learned a lot. I really have learned a lot about how SQL databases misbehave, and they really do. Um, yeah, you should, I'll get to some examples later on. Um, so we decided I'm gonna start with housekeeping, doing simple things like, uh, you know, setting up static analysis, uh, set up tests, and the initial test was very, very slim because I could only test things that didn't in touch the database, so I think the initial test coverage was like 10%. It was pretty bad. Um, but we set it up in CI and Travis, so now we have tests running all the time. So that's great. We can now measure our improvements. So that's the first things that I do on pretty much any project I ever work on. Things that I normally don't do on the projects I work on is write documentation, which, yeah, I did here. Um, write a whole set of test doubles, which is... Um, it's a whole other topic with the testing. So when you do testing, I don't want to test against the real thing. I don't want to test against the real service. I want to test against a double that I can replace. And when I'm doing persistence, I don't want to test against, say, my production database and change data that's not persisted forever. I want to be able to have a double that can be replaced at a time and then, you know, just run for the test and then I can throw it away afterwards. It's, it's a proper pretend database, which in this case could be any database, actually, because um, it's done, the way we modeled is um, Django tests. If you run Django test, it does it to set up a teardown of a database. And often you configure a different test database than your, your normal real database. Um, and more often than not, the test database is an in-memory SQL database, in-memory uh, SQLite database, which is great. It makes tests run fast. Um, obviously, there is differences, but that's, that's okay. Test doubles are not supposed to be perfect. And um, retroactively write tests for I don't know, that I don't know. This is something I don't normally do, except I've started doing it at work in the last two months, so this is a bit out of date. I do now normally do it. Um, and obviously using my own code. That is, is, a, is, is a, a new thing. I'm sure you all know. Uh, normally you just deploy code, other people use it and tell you if there's a problem. Yeah, you try it yourself and you go like, mm, no, that didn't really work. Anyway, so 
as I said, with the testing, we had examples. We have plenty of little examples that he built on how he wanted to have this used. And they worked. Um, so I said, well, we could just take those and use fat tests. So this might be contentious uh, in when it comes to, to doing tests. And people say you should not have fat tests. You should have slimmer tests because they are less likely to fail. Well, I'm like, well, no, I think fat tests is a great place to start. They fail, which means that if you refactor something, then they fail if you do it wrong. So that's great. So we started with that and um, wrote a lot of unit tests. And the big thing, which unfortunately just a little point here, was redoing transactions so that our tests would each roll back the database to a known state before the next test run so that the test can be run in any order and will not fail randomly. So there was actually quite a lot of work that I did on that um, to get tests up and going. And um, inevitably, as you work on a project, I'm sure many of you know, you start a work project, you come in late, you look at it, you think you understand it, the more you look at it, the more you realize, hmm, I'm missing some points here, I don't know. This is evidently what happened. So how do you use a thing? What do you do with this? What, and what is correct behavior when it comes to data retention? Um, a, a good example is, does limit make sense for deletes? So if I say, delete everything where the title is peanut, uh, but only the first 10 of them. Does that actually make sense? Like, you just contradict yourself. You said everything, and then you said only the first 10. You know, so how do I know these things? And this is, um, and the question obviously arises, what is actually a good ORM? So, well, didn't really know. We started with a set of priorities. We said, okay, fine. Um, we wanted to minimally dictate how your project structure is. So um, if you used Django, you'll find that it's very uh, bossy. You have to have the project set up in a certain way for it to work. But once you get this boilerplate all set up, um, it works great. But if you have an existing project and you want to now use, say, a Django functionality, it, it's, it's difficult. It's really, it's too bossy. Um, so we said we don't want it to be bossy. We want it to be, like, we want it to not dictate how your project needs to run. Um, and this was actually quite an issue what is more important? Is it correctness or ease of use or performance or maintenance more important? Maintenance got shoved all the way to the back because we think we're brave. Um, maybe it's a stupid decision. I don't know. Well, time will tell. But um, you can clearly see the mascot is a tortoise and performance is not at the front. Like Performance is important, but the point of an ORM is not performance. It's convenience. And it's only convenient if it is obvious and does what you expect it to do which is why correctness is the first thing. And the next thing is we need a community. We're right, we were two people. I uh, don't think that qualifies as a community. Um, don't have one yet, we'll get there, uh, I hope. <laughs> so, right, and then a discussion of what is a good RM. I keep on forgetting this screen here. Um, so at a high level, it's something that allows you to reduce the complexity of your application, because I want to just persist data. I don't want to care exactly how it's stored. I just want to say, I think this object needs to be saved somewhere. Done. I shouldn't get any surprises. I shouldn't uh, say, all right, uh, the person is called, you know, R Rene, and then the accent gets removed. Like, that would be a surprise. I don't want that to happen, ever. Um, it should have the features that I need, but not necessarily the ones that get in the way. And the reason why we came up with that is uh, SQL Alchemy and uh, what's the big Java RM, I forgot the name, Hibernate. Uh, they have so many features that you don't actually know which one to use sometimes. It's like um, you have too many choices. Can't you just give me a good default? Because I don't, if I care, I'll override it. If I don't, just give me a good option. Uh, it needs to obviously perf not, the performance needs to be good enough. It doesn't need, should not suck. And um, it should cleanly abstract away differences of databases, which is um, actually impossible. So. We try as good as we can, but databases uh, they have too many little exceptions. And I can, I'll get to that later on as some of the, the weird things that I notice databases do. Um, um, others, so evidently, we needed to expand this to something that we can measure, because saying it needs to have the features we need, but not the ones we don't need, a bit vague. So we need to be reliable. I need to have a succinct syntax, uh, consistent, uh, enough field types, secure. We don't want side effects. Performance should be fine. I uh, should be able to tailor it to my needs, but optionally. Uh, and this is sort of countering the effect of where uh, instead of giving you too many options up front, you start with the base thing, but allow someone to change it. 
Um, we need data migrations, and serialization is always important. It's a thing that you'd need for an ORM. You need to serialize and deserialize data in and out in a convenient way. Um, so now we have an idea of what supposedly is a good ORM, um, and why is it actually difficult? Well, databases, they, are, they really are awesome. I mean, honestly, they, they do so much things, and they do really well, but they all doing their own thing. They're snowflakes. That's a word of my previous company that we used when we described something. I think it fits exactly. They are bizarre. Um, and another thing is we're trying to hide an insane amount of complexity behind simple syntax, um, which is nice from a usability point of view, but databases are not consistent. So it actually makes it more complicated in that regard. And then the third thing is async added some new complexities. Um, a good example is well, here I wrote that uh, I have to ensure that uh, different async coroutines don't uh, share the same uh, transaction state. Um, so I'll have a, let's say, I'll say, I want to start a transaction in this coroutine path, and then on the same event loop, another transaction should be running, and I want to guarantee that they don't interfere. So I need to have the equivalent of thread local, but for async, which was, turns out to actually be a thing. I didn't know about it until I looked for it. Um, and there's a few, a few more related things, such as a lot of the libraries block, um, but Bruce did mention that. Um, honestly, there is nothing in an ORM or a, the database drivers that actually make it difficult. It has been pretty easy. We don't really know why there haven't been many other attempts, um, other than the one case of there being hostility. It might just be a case of async IO is new, and nobody else has really put a lot of effort into it yet. Um, more reasons, SQL injection. Um, it's a thing. We should stop it. Um, data mangling. Here's a, a simple example. Uh, my SQL will silently truncate a string if it's too long. Um, replace an int with max int. Uh, another thing is if you send in a date in a datetime field and it doesn't parse it correctly, it just silently replaces it with none. So there's a, quite a few things when my SQL will mangle your data, but it is not unique. SQL Server does the same. AUC does. Uh, SQLite does. So far, I haven't found any examples in Postgres, so uh, I guess. That's a thumbs up for Postgres. It doesn't really destroy your data. It just tells you you're being an idiot, which is probably better, I think, as a programmer. I would want to know if I'm doing it wrong. Um, another example, SQLite's super relaxed. It literally has an integer, which is the primary key, a number type, and a string, which is actually a blob, not really. It's text. And that's the only three data types it has. And one of the data types will always exist, and it will always be the primary key, even if you tell it something else is the primary key. It has a row ID that's always there, and it's the only integer object in it. It's, it's, so we ended up have to do a lot of uh, cursing and wrapping of objects for SQLite so that we don't get bizarre answers. You write in a date, you get back a string or a number. Like, weird things like that would happen. You're like, what, why? No, at least now we know what the data type, what the schema is. We can know how to convert back to the right format. So it's things that we'll have to do. Um, Select where field equals null is a good example of, it seems obvious. I want to find something where certain fields value is null. Null. You'll never get an answer. On any of the databases, they never return any results. They want you to say, is none. Just so there's that subtle difference where I want to hide this complexity from the user. You must be able to say, if some value is null, this is obviously what you want, it should now allow that to actually happen. We should uh, detect these edge cases and, can, and handle them. Um, I mentioned earlier the delete from. It's a thing. It's syntax syntactically valid, but the database has never listened to you. So I don't even know why it's syntactically valid. Um, it's like bizarre things that you come across with databases. Um, MySQL doesn't have case sensitive operations. That was quite a surprise. And transactions are difficult, but we really have to thank when ACID came up with their spec. It put a lot of standardization in, and it, it actually meant that transactions once we got the frameworks working, it actually worked the same on every database, which was surprising. So that's actually a pro, not a con. Um, and then obviously, subtle things, like I want to insert a record to a database, but I want to know what the primary key is, especially if it's an auto number. Um, there's every one of the databases we support does in a different way. Um, SQLite, you need to, in the same cursor, get a new query to get the result of the last row ID. If you don't, there's no real way to find it. You have to filter and search and fetch it in somehow. Uh, MySQL has a last row ID. 
parameter on the cursor that always exists, it could be none. And Postgres, you have extra parameter where you say, well, and this insert statement should return, and it can be anything, which is actually quite lovely. I can make it return a generated value from a join or some other thing, it's okay. It's actually, it, that was actually quite nice to discover. So that is a, a sample of reasons why I think ORMs are often quite difficult to, work, to develop on because there's too many little things going on and there's a lot more. I'm sure many things that I don't know. Um, so how does Tortoise compare? Nah, it's okay so far. I mean, I think we got the syntax done right. We modeled it after a syntax that we actually liked. Um, We've spent a bit of effort in making it consistent, and I think it has enough field types because as I was starting to write sample applications, I haven't gotten a point yet where I'm like, ah, I need this field type, you know, but that subject, it's, it's, um, it's my opinion, it's not really true. When it comes to secure and reliable, we haven't tested it. We don't know. We hope. We will have to come and actually determine what that is. So the big question marks, I don't know. Um, so we've done a fair amount of work on preventing side effects, but... I don't have confidence in it yet because I haven't thrown a fuzzer at it. And the hypothesis as a fuzzer is great. I love it, and it always causes crashes. So let's see if it's... Um, and a database is a, an ORM is a, a perfect case for use of um, something like hypothesis fuzzer. I want to be able to generate potential edge case data and ensure that it transforms to and back and doesn't change at all. And this is where a tool like hypothesis would really be useful. So it's something I want to do. I haven't gotten around to it. Uh, performance, I'll get to that later, it was really bad. I mean, our, our mascot was a very good um, representation. Um, but it's gotten a lot better with very little work. Um, but there's a lot more to do. And uh, we have not spent any time in really doing tailoring at the stage. Um, it's something we still have to address. We haven't done data migrations. We decided they are too difficult to not do properly. So we will do that as a proper project. And Andre is actually working on serialization at this stage. Um, it's the current project is working on. So that should come soon, I hope. Um, all right, so there we have that. What is Tortoise ORM? Tortoise ORM is a object relational mapper, uh, which is written for use of CPython larger equal to 3.5. Um, we ran into an issue with 3.5.2. So I think we're going to say larger than 3.5.3 um, because they Changed some of the syntax in async I, uh, I can't remember which one it was. Um, I think it's got to do with the, the, the event loop local variables, uh, which we need for transactions. Um, so it's to be designed to be used without enforcing convention, as I mentioned. Um, we use a variant of active record. If you're into RMs, which I wasn't, I didn't know what that meant. Pretty much it means that when you create an object, it, rev it mirrors what's in the database, when the data store. Um, except we're not making it automatically persist. Uh, some ORMs like uh, Rails um, will auto automatically uh, um, persist. And uh, I don't know, I prefer some explicit. So you have to have a .save before it actually will save. Um, so that's the one deviation of the active record, but it's pretty much an active record system. Um, we support SQLite, MySQL, Postgres, and um, actually I think the tests are running with MariaDB. But either way, it's close enough. I'm not worried. Uh, we have testing doubles. Um, actually, I should have shown that in the slides. Um, we do support many field types. I think it's a whole list. Uh, Query API is modeled after the Django Q operator, if any of you have used it. It is actually comprehensive enough. Um, it does a lot of things. We're using a library called, I forgot now, PyPika in the back end to generate our uh, SQL. Um, it's a very, very nice library. It's, it's, it's comprehensive and it supports many more databases and many more dialects and they've done a good job of wrapping a lot of the complexity. Um, it was one of the reasons of performance issues which we managed to fix um, by a, a small PR. Um, and a pilot plugin because we're doing meta classes because that's how do you convert when you define a class into something that actually persists. You need to rewrite it and pilot we, as one of the first uh, linters we threw at us, just looked at this code and said, I don't know what you're on about. So we had to write a pilot plugin. And um, so it's there for anybody to use if they want to use it. So here's this little sample of the syntax. It's a very, this is essentially from just the sample, the documentation. It works. So you import model and fields from Tortoise. You create a class 
which subclasses model, and you define some fields, and this looks very much like how Django models definitions look. It's modeled to look much the same. Um, we even have the meta class, but currently that's all, the only use for that is to define your table name. It's not much else, but it's modeled in a s similar structure. It's, we hope that being familiar would actually help people do, um, knowing how it works. Um, to get the initialization working, um, we like the discovery portion of Django, but which is where we have this in the section here in the models, you define the model you want to include. You have a list of all the files that have your models, and it will only look in there. It will, when you run the torture in it, it will open those documents and process them at that stage, meaning that I don't have to have useless inserts lying around like some of the ORMs I looked at. And um, I really do like the fact that you can define a database um, with a URL, um, or some systems start implementing that. And so we said, no, even though we have an expanded thing, we provide a helper that will convert a URI into the expanded thing. And the syntax we use is exactly the same as Django environment syntax, um, which is relatively concise. And we have currently a generate schemas function. That's our sole attempt at migration to the stage. We're going to leave it at that and replace it with a proper migration system at a certain stage. We're not going to do uh, fixtures until we do migrations because you can't do fixtures right without migrations because your fixture, your data, your DDL changes um, and your fixtures don't. So your fixtures need to get migrated. So we're not, we, we decided to not do any of those until we get migrations, which is not, well, it's probably going to be a next year project. And then um, you, so assuming you're running inside an async application, um, it's pretty much the same, except for the differences. Anytime when you do I/O, you have to do an await, which is the the one thing that's both nice and not so nice about async I/O. These uh, I/O does not happen automatically, but you know exactly when it happens, so you, you can see it in your code. So you can at least reason about a this is going to interfere or not. So some syntax, and it's very much the same as as Django's models. Um, it, this is it. It actually worked when I tried it first time which is why I kind of got into it. So let's get back to the topic of performance. Yes, it's a tortoise. It's a nice tortoise. It's one of those, um, those books, I forgot the name, the publisher, O'Reilly books. Um, it's a, you know, a very abstract thing, but he, he liked tortoises, which was his reason for calling it tortoise. So there we go. So I went around, built a few, this is a subset of the, of the benchmark scenarios, and I went and I identified as many Python ORMs I could find. And pretty much, I have some, cr some criteria, it should have been current, current around Python 3.6, and then I normalized the data. So um, in terms of performance, so the highest, higher it is, the better it is. So Pony, which is an ORM I've never heard of before, so clearly they focus on performance. I mean, just killing everything else. Um, and uh, <sighs> it's a pixel. You know, some of those benchmarks are a pixel here. You know, it's, it was not good, honestly. Um, but it was not that difficult to fix up. I mean, we actually, I spent a bit of effort um, doing inserts out of a transaction, in the transaction, massive speed up. That was like a more than 100-fold 100, 100 speed up. Um, we were not too bad with selects. There was just a case of fixing up, um, like, the, uh, the, the model uh, in it, the, the constructor, getting that to run a bit better. And um, gets. I didn't spend any time optimizing that yet, but doing the other optimizations did improve the, the gets. Um, so we're, we're not that bad now, we're okay, at least for my set of tests, which is simple. I mean, once I actually add more joins and, and these things, I'll probably find more horrific stories, but the nice thing is, um, it wasn't that difficult. It was a week's work of me after hours every other day. It wasn't that bad. A majority of the fixes, because these tests were done in SQLite, was actually with a synchronization issue. We are wrapping SQLite in a separate thread and doing a synchronization between AsyncO and SQLite, because SQLite's API is synchronous. It doesn't have an asynchronous API, so we had to wrap one around it. And a lot of that was the way that we were passing messages between the thread and the event loop. So uh, I'd say one order of magnitude performance on these benchmarks came from that just fixing that up. Another word of magic came from uh, doing silly things, um, like PyPika, it's an excellent library, and one of the things it does is it guarantees that whenever you modify, 
your object to generate a new SQL query, it's always um, like a side effect. You know, it's a, I forgot the word. You can say this and then modify it in one direction, then modify another direction. It's always uh, it will never it'll never have any uh, changes happening. What's that? I forgot the term. Functional, immutable. There we go. Thank you. Sorry. So it's always immutable, which is great. It makes it a lot easier to use and it gets rid of surprises. But the way the guaranteed immutable was actually doing a deep copy. Um, so when I was running the initial benchmark of inserting on uh, within a transaction, it was deep copy was using 75% of the, of the compute time. So we managed to get rid of that and uh, with the help of them, a, a not that big a PR, um, and it gave everything else a performance improvement um, and optimized model instantiation um, pretty much to the point where if I make it, to make it run any faster, we have to, what's it? Quick. Five minutes. Here. I have too much to talk about. I'll go quicker. Um, we go. You know, I have to do code, uh, we have to do code generation or C modules, so it's quite a bit of a plan. Uh, we do have a plan to release version one soon, which is mostly connect, fiction connection pooling, which we broke when we fixed transactions. So we have to rewrite it. I don't know why it's not working. Um, but we have tests that all fail, so that's great. Um, schema rege regeneration factor is halfway done. As I said, performance, we, I think we're okay for version one. Um, we're only at 91% test coverage. We really could be better. Uh, documentation, as always. Um, I would love to turn the test examples into doc tests to see if I could do that. Um, and what does it mean if we hit version one? We'll stop, trying, we'll stop breaking the API, so then we should allow people to use it, and we'll see how it goes. Um, so obviously these are things that we were planning to do after. We want to do migrations after. Serialization is, I think, for working after, although it might come earlier. Aggregate functions, um, we were using types as much as we could, but it was, I think that uh, it, we had to put it in afterwards in the code. And uh, I, I guess Sentry plugins, because I mean, they're quite useful to find issues. So if you have this registered, you can then see what the SQL queries was happening and whatever, whatever the community has to come up with. So the next step is to try and build a community. Um, GitHub has a lovely guide on open source the guide. It's a URL and it's, a, it's got about eight like little blog posts that are quite detailed and talking about um, things that worked well for, for open source projects and things that didn't um, that you have to watch out for. So we currently have three code contributors, um, two extra people that talk on issues and more than 100 stars, which is the most of any project I've worked on. But how do we get more of the people that actually just look at it to use it and come back with feedback? Because I mean, we've only had two people who came back with feedback from 100. We need more, or three if you include uh, an extra contributor on that. So that's one of the things we really need to do. Um, and obviously fix up all the little missing things about what makes a good RM, but we're gonna do that after version one. For some reason, Andre, not for some reason, he decided he wants to call it version one something that's gonna be an API stable interface. Um, and that's really it. All right. Thank you. Is this working? All right. Uh, so earlier you mentioned one of the problems with the async um, ORM is making sure that two transactions that are running concurrently don't share state. Mm. Um, so for the fix that. Um, I assume when you're fixing that, like you can't really guarantee that the states uh, of two concurrent transactions are like disparate. So if they are sharing state, the fix for that, um, does that mean that the performance of the fix is pretty much similar to if you were running them sequentially? Uh, I don't, there isn't really a performance issue. Um, so in Python 3.7, mm. they added a event loop local storage, which is a a, a every time you branch, every task that happens has a base state that it keeps with it. And they only made that accessible in, in uh, Python 3.7. So that's been backported um, and with the help of a library and will work on Python 3.353 and up. So that's what we ended up using. We did not notice performance issues at all. Right, so, um, it, but that's, that's Python local state, not database state. No, yes, that's the Python local state. Okay. The database local state's a different thing we have to have um, there it's status on a, on a per connection basis on a mm. 
So there, if we want to have multiple connections open, we can actually only have as many connections open as we have, or transactions running as we have connections open. So if we hit our ceiling, we have to halt something until a source clears up. Um, so this is part of the, I think this is one of the things that broke with the thread pooling mm -hmm. that we started to get around to fix. Okay. Um, but we're not exactly sure what that issue is. Okay, okay. Yes. thank you. Hi, um, that's really cool uh, presentation, man. Okay. So did you guys ever run into that problem where you have an object that references another object and then that, ob like somewhere down the hierarchy, it references uh, back up and you have to figure out which, um, where your your reference um, columns would, would, would be on which table when you're mapping to SQL? I haven't tested that out. Yeah. So, no, I'm not actually sure if it's going to behave in an odd way. I mean, what we've defined is pretty much you define a foreign key and you can define a look back key, which is a inserted key into the, ob into the ref reference object. Um, I, yeah. I actually haven't thought that I might actually have, a, if, what happens if I do a cyclic yeah. th setup if there's going to be a problem? Because I, I found with ORMs that's, um, that's they, th certain ORMs solve that in different ways. Uh, so how I, I think we're solving it, because I'm just thinking about how the code is done. We first build the one side of the sources of where the foreign keys are defined. And then as a post process, we add the, uh, the, the objects on the other side. So I don't think it'll be a problem. It should. I will have to test it. Thank you. Good idea. A remark on the delete with the limit. Um, I am pretty convinced that different uh, database implementations will handle differently. But the pr place where something like that is useful if you want to delete a lot of stuff, but you don't want to lock the table for a long time. So that's a valid point. In a case where your, where your database can actually identify which records are the first thousand pretty quickly and then stop looking for more, that's useful. So find them, delete them, uh, free up the table, other people do some work, and then rerun okay. the query again Thank you. Un you just un answered. until it's cleaned up. There is an issue on GitHub as to a question as to if we should allow this or not because it seems conflicting. Some databases don't honor it. Um, I know for a fact that SQLite doesn't, but I, some might. I mean, we have to test if they honor it or not. But it's a good idea, thank you. Okay, so for some databases, uh, for some ORMs, I find, um, uh, obviously, to you abstract between different databases, you know, your Postgres, your SQLite, and you kind of have to do like a lowest common denominator when it comes to supported features. Mm. Have you given any thought to perhaps supporting features that are perhaps more database specific, but perhaps have like a uglier implementation yes. in say um, another database? Yes, we do. So um, the case for that was a JSON field is a very useful thing. Whereas in Postgres, it's got the, it's got a JSON field of, like type there and you can in, it's indexable and all these things. Whereas in other races, it's not. So we're actually just sorting a, sorting a serial blob. So searches on it don't really work, but some of the, most of the features, as much as we can get work. Um, so we, do we have a policy that we want to emulate missing functionality to as much as reasonable. Um, so yes, we're trying, but this is it. Some things won't ever work right. Um, great presentation. Thanks so much for the work in the community. That's, that's very nice. Okay. Uh, I wonder if you, I uh, believe you're using the default event loop for Python in your tests and everything. I wonder if you tried like another custom event loop for like performance tests or something like that. Uh, like, I think Trio UV is loop. one of them or something like I that. I ran it with UV loop once, didn't notice any problems, but it's not part of the test suite. Okay. Um, no. We're not using any features that isn't defined at the top level. All right. So it should work. We're not change, because I mean the big difference with UV loop and the async IO standard uh, event loop is how sockets and these things work. Uh, we leave, if you're gonna do sockets, we leave that to the database driver. So as long as the database driver works with it, I think we should be fine. Okay, okay. Yeah. Just, just wondering, thank you. Cool. 
I noticed you mentioned the supporting C Python greater than 3.5. Is there some reason it wouldn't work with other Python implementations? Um, not, it probably should. I, I suspect you wouldn't be too difficult to get it to work with, uh, what's it, PyPy. Um, the one catch was we don't, didn't know if we wanted to support PyPy because the Postgres driver we're using definitely failed to build with PyPy. Um, whereas the MySQL one and SQLite ones, well, SQLite one is pure Python, um, they will work, I think. I'm fairly certain they will work. So we could probably support it partially, but we haven't, we, there's bigger issues at this stage. Um, what Postgres driver are you using? Not uh, async PG. Not that one. You're using, are, you, are you using, async, using PG? async PG? Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. That's the one that doesn't want to build on PyPy. There is on, I think AOPG will build on PyPy. Yeah. Yes. Um, but we're currently only supporting async PG. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question. And then I've got some announcements to make. Anyone else want to ask a question? Yeah, right. Andrew. Andrew? So the subqueries and aggrega aggregations that's on the to-do list, obviously that's, that can get quite tricky in SQL. Um, are you planning on doing that kind of low level at each, each database level, or would you do it just in the Python? Uh, uh, the plan is to get a generic common denominator in the Python um, sure. system. Um, there is so many, especially uh, like uh, Postgres and if you work with AAC or IQ, one of those other dialects, there's so many custom things they do that it's not m useful for us to actually try that. If you really want to do that, you're probably an advanced enough user to just request the cursor and use it, I think. Sure. Cool, thanks so much. You have Thank a you. really, really great speaking way of speaking. You're so calm, it's lovely. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so just two announcements. So after lunch, you guys can collect your swag from OfferZen uh, on the way back from lunch, just as the way you're coming back towards the talks. And the other thing is, if anyone wants to join an open session in the foyer to do with uh, Python in Africa, it's in the foyer. And uh, we've got some really amazing community leaders here at PyCon ZA this year. So I think it's well worth checking out. Cool. Thanks so much. Cool. Well done. Thank you.